Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Mandel, and I am the EPA Region 3 Environmental Justice Coordinator. Um, I am so honored and privileged to be a part of this um, incredibly inspiring and motivating session. Um, we are beyond thrilled to have the um, CEO and founder of one of the leading um, community groups in the South Richmond and beyond um, community in Leah Whitehurst Gibson, who's going to share um, just a wealth of really motivating um, past, current, and future efforts. Her uh, community group, Virginia Community Voice, is doing um, really throughout, not just Richmond, but well beyond. Um, just again, really, really, really excited to um, have Leah be here to share her story. And again, I hopefully it inspires us all. Before, really, without further ado, I just, uh, again, am so thrilled to uh, turn this over to, to Leah, um, who's inspired me and many of my, uh, certainly my counterparts, not just here in EPA, but also throughout the state um, for those who really are investing and working hard in advancing environmental justice and equity. So with that, Leah, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and take your time and sharing your screen. We're here for you. So no rush. And we'll get into it when you're all set and ready to go. Thanks, Leah. All right, thank you so much, Alex, for that kind introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Are we good on, on volume? Sounding great. Wonderful. Thank y'all so much for having me today. Um, as Alex said, my name is Leah Whitehurst Gibson. I'm the executive founder and executive director for Virginia Community Voice, an organization that works here, as you can see in this picture on the south side of Richmond, Virginia. Um, I always like to officially introduce myself as um, um, in the context of history, and you'll see that theme through this conversation today, that um, we know that we are only where we are because of our history. And the only way that we can figure out where we're going in the future is to make sure that our history, um, that we remember it and we can understand the context for our, the present and then go into the future. So I like to always introduce myself, not with <laughs> credentials and, and all of those things, but like in the context of the, the history that has made me. And so uh, my name is, again, like I said, Leah Whitehurst Gibson. I'm the daughter of Winston and Luberta Whitehurst. Um, we, from my mother, I learned uh, how to fearlessly fight for the people that I love and to never, um, to never, to never stop that search for truth and for and for moving things forward in the community. For my father, I learned deep compassion um, and empathy for my community. Growing up, my mother told me stories of when she was a child and how she um, and her siblings experienced uh, violence, racism, crosses being burned in their yard, and the fear that she had with that, and then the goals that she had to keep her kids from having to deal with that kind of fear. For my dad, uh, he, he was the kind of person that never let hate or grudges or any of those things keep him from loving people. And I've seen him my entire life meet racism and hate and pain with love. I'm the granddaughter of Charlotte and Jean. Charlotte, um, who we called Nana, uh, was, born in Virginia. My ancestral home is in Chesapeake, Virginia. She was born in Virginia, but um, after escaping a, a bad marriage and um, moving to, to, to New York with her three children, she kind of took an unconventional path that, than most Black women at that time. And I learned from her resilience. I learned she's the strongest woman I know. She's 90 now, and she's so strong. Um, and I learned I learned from her that resilience of, of, of doing the thing that not everybody wants to see you do or everybody is supportive of, or maybe the thing that's a little bit innovative of the time. But that historical kind of transition is what we what we know as the great migration where people from black people from the south moved to the north um, in, in search of opportunity. My grand my grandmother Jean um, raised seven children. And um, many of her 21 grandchildren, she, uh, her house and she as a person was always a place for um, 
for a haven for our whole family and for many people that that considered her a confidant and someone that they could lean on. I'm the great granddaughter of Molly, Eva, and uh, and Savannah, uh, and Mary, <laughs> but. Um, I know less about them, but I know Grandma Eva had the faith that could move mountains. And Grandma Mary made hard choices her whole life, but those cho choices led to her only son uh, being one of the first Black men to graduate from Virginia Tech University and um, then be going on to, to, to get a doctorate degree. And what I understand from them is that they they had to be these strong pillars of their community at a time where there were so many things coming against them. And you know, not only did my did my family, uh, my uh, immediate family that I that I know, do revolutionary things, but I am the descendant of two great aunts who started one of the first organizations run by Black women, funded by Black women, called the Secret Order of the Tents that was based in Chesapeake, Virginia, or and still is in existence today. It was one of the first organizations to fight against unaffordable housing and unequal education. They were a part of the Underground Railroad, and they fought for justice their entire lives. And um, that ancestry also goes even further, because uh, when we were searching as many people of color and people in general are doing right now for our for our roots in, in ancestry.com. We found my mom's maiden name is Demby and we found a letter um, where Frederick Douglass wrote to one of my ancestors thanking him for his kind hospitality when he was in Chesapeake that time. So, so I come from a long line of people fighting for what is right for their community, making sure the voices of those who have been marginalized, including themselves, gets um, gets a, a place at the table and a seat at the table. And that is what um, Virginia Community Voice is all about. And so we'll talk more about that. But in my body, I'm both sustained by my ancestors, by their, by their will and by their fight. Um, and I'm also, um, I hold the, the legacy of the enslaved in my body. I'm grateful that I get to be a free Black woman, but I also know the pain and the legacy that they took the the secret order of the tents, they coined the term lift as we climb. And while that is what they had, the knowledge they had at the time, it has left a burden for us, right? Our backs are our backs are getting a little weak for lifting and climbing at the same time. And so we need healing in our community. And we're gonna talk a little bit today about how community organizing can be a, a, a road and a path to that community healing. So if you're gonna take away a couple of things from this conversation today, um, take away these themes. One, knowing our history, is, is incredibly important to understanding our present and then building a different future for ourselves, for our families, for our children. Um, and learning the power of building tables with historically marginalized communities um, to build a liber liberated future where everyone has what they need to thrive. And the third thing is opening our minds to an imagination that is possible when people who have been kept away and out of the, off of the table, away from the decisions uh, that, they're, that, that are changing the way that they move in their community. Um, when, when we engage people to be at that table, uh, the future um, is a beautiful one. And, it, and, and, and it, there's an imagination that people can engage in that we haven't necessarily seen before. And so that's really what we're gonna talk about today about how those things feed into Virginia community voice and then create this, this beautiful future through power, through voice, through people having a seat at the decision-making table. And so as I um, move on to this next to the ne to this next slide, um, I always want to, again, as we think about our history, I always want to acknowledge where we are and who stewarded the land that I am on before me. So I always want to take a moment to say, um, yeah, imagine you're here in Richmond with me. I know many of you are not in, in Virginia, but imagine you're here in Richmond with me. Um, imagine that you're standing with me, walking the streets of this community. Uh, what, what, you, what you need to understand is that our past, especially in Richmond, Virginia, because there's so much happened here, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, is, is how we can, like, we have to put that in the light of where we are right now. And so I always want to acknowledge um, the Native tribes that... Sacrifice, not and not sacrifices that they wanted to make, but sacrifices that they were forced to make. Um, they stewarded this land before we came here. And then 
um, enslaved bodies worked this land, built this land, and got this land to where it is. Uh, my ancestors and the ancestors of those that I know built this land and made this land what it is. And so I want to always in bring them into conversations around where we're going and how, how we think about that and how we steward the land. Um, <clears throat> and so just a little bit of like history, right? Because I said history, pulling those strings through, that's what we're doing. That's part of this conversation. So I want to start with a little bit of the history. So prior to colonization by the British, we understand that Native communities lived on this land in right relationship with this land. That's another theme that you're going to see. We want to get ourselves and our bodies back to living in right relationship with the land, also in right relationship with each other, right? And so for thousands of years prior to colonization, Native communities did that. Um, I'm going to name a few of the tribes that were a part of that, because I think it's important to call them into these conversations, the Arahatic tribe, the Appomattox tribe, the Manaponi, the Pamumki, and they were all a part, and the Yehuganat, Yehuganat, um, were co core members of the Powhatan chiefdom, so that the Powhatan nation. Um, and we know a lot of these stories, so I'm not going to belabor them too much, but I do think that it's important to see this history in the light of where we are right now. And so these, so in 1607, Christopher Newport, if you know anything about Virginia, you know we have a university named after, um, after Christopher Newport came on order of the crown to say, hey, we're you go go conquer that land for for king and or queen and country or king and country at the time. They renamed the river to the James River. And after many fights with the native communities, um, the native community succumbed to uh, to that, to that, uh, that, uh, that, that fight, that, uh, that aggression. And even though this community had a, had a strong and thriving, uh, native, um, native neighborhoods and native people living on that and, and, and stewarding the land, um, they did not, they were not able to successfully keep it. And then in 1619, the first enslaved Africans again arrived in Virginia and reached the Richmond area via the James River, the now James River that was renamed. And over the next hundred years, thousands of enslaved people would be trafficked through this region. So just down the street, there's a place called Lumpkin's Jail where um, 50 people uh, a day were being auctioned off, 50 black people a day, my ancestors that I'm sure came through Lumpkin's Jail were being auctioned a day in this community, right? So this was a, a hub for human trafficking in this, in this um, right down the street in our neighborhood. And then of course we get to the Civil War during Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and the Civil Rights Movement in modern times, we saw the South Side, which is the part of the community that we work on in Richmond. It's the South Side of Richmond, it's across the river. So again, if you're walking the streets with me, you're gonna go across the James River to get to the South Side. It's, it's separated from the rest of the city by the river. Um, the South Side was used to dilute the Black vote. And so in, uh, I think, believe it was 1907, the city of Richmond annexed Chester, 23 miles of Chesterfield County, which now is the South Side of Richmond. Um, and 147,000 at that, at that time white people um, to dilute the Black vote in, in the city. And so um, while a lot of the Counselors at that time said this was about, <clears throat> excuse me, that this was about economic development and growing the city. Some of them secretly um, whispered about how that they how how this was really about diluting the black vote. And so during the same time period, Virginia was forced to integrate schools. We had massive white flight in South Richmond, major demographic changes in the community, and um, and then more recently, the South Side has had a, a very long period of low economic growth, declining property values, loss of business uh, due to racist housing policies and redlining. Many South Richmond residents who we work with now and who've lived on the South Side for a long time talk about how the South Side has been largely forgotten. And in the last 10 years though, there's been all this interest in the South Side because everybody, well, and this is probably a familiar story to you from your communities and from what you see in your neighborhoods as well. Um, all of a sudden there's all this interest in developing, de developing the South Side. But the crucial issue is that it's not including the voice of the neighbors. And um, back in, back in uh, 2000, when they did the last master plan for the city, uh, there were places all over the rest of the city, downtown and north side, the east end, um, that were 
um, included in that master plan, but very little focus on the South side of Richmond. And so people have been saying for a long time that the South side has been just left out. We've been the stepchild of, of Richmond city and, um, and, and they want to change it. And so this is why we've been organizing on the South side of Richmond since 2017. Um, these are the neighborhoods. Again, you can see the river on this, on this map and the neighborhoods that we work in. Um, again, come to Richmond with me, walk the streets with me. I know this is a virtual setting, but, but that's, um, that's part of what we're trying to do. We're imagining that we're in these places together. So, so this is what, these are the neighborhoods that we work in. All of the census tracts that we work in um, have been um, are uh, low income census tracts, right? And so for many of the neighbors, for members that are a part of our work, which we call RVA Thrives, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, they live in these zip codes on the South side where the median income is a little over $36,000 a year. Um, but that's 71% of the city's median income and only 40% of the area median income for the region, which is at 89,400 and our region of about 2 million people. So, so we can see that all of these things are feeding into what's going on in, in South Richmond. All of these different factors are, are working together. And we also know that the South Side has a large and growing Hispanic community. And these communities um, have been, of course, as we know, um, you know, they they haven't been really counted in the census in the same way, right? Because of because of some of these issues, but we also know that they are being discriminated against. Wage theft reports, um, discrimination, limited ways for undocumented people to figure out what to do, and so all of these things feed into the culture and what's going on in South Side. And so. The EPA, though, has identified the South Side as a community that inspires, which we actually agree, because while all these statistics that I just went over um, are true about the South Side, it does not define the South Side. The neighbors on the South Side have so much pride in their community. They want to see what um, what they have visions and hopes and dreams for what can be. And I'll talk more about that as we go through this presentation. Um, but we have to put these things in the context of history because what it does do, while it doesn't define our community, it does um, give us an understanding of the lack of resources that have been invested in this community over many years. And so you see here a map of um, urban heat vulnerability. So the South Side is hotter, and we'll talk about that in a second. And you can see kind of these redlining maps. These are these are heat maps and redlining maps that are a part that that you're seeing in front of you. And so the things that we that we identified when we first came to the South Side, the first thing was um, power and voice, right? So we saw that. Um, when we started listen, our listening process in 2017 with neighbors, we had over a thousand neighbors that were a part of that process of a community of about 20,000. So not, you know, we got we got a lot of input on on that work. Uh, they described the South Side as the redheaded stepchild across the river. They described the South Side as um, as there, there, there was no strategy. There was no, I talked to people that said, you know, I've been waiting 12 years. I've called the city to try and get this down power line in my, in my neighborhood fixed, but no one is, no one has done anything for 12 years. And when it rains, it's dangerous and it's not great for my family, but they were ignored. And so we even met with some people who said that uh, at, in, in city government that said they would rather focus on Monument Avenue. If you remember in the news a few years ago, Monument Avenue was a big was big in the news because of all these monuments, these Confederate monuments that were coming down. That's also the rich part of town in Richmond. That's a part of, of town where you have a lot of a lot of money. You don't have the, it's not a heat island. It's none of those things. But we met with, with some officials that said, we're gonna focus over there because that's the tax base. That's where people are paying a lot of money for their houses rather than focus on the south side and so our solution to that right was power building and leadership development in the community we wanted to make sure that the community had a voice and we could start to set a table where they had a space to sit and say what they needed and then to fight for the resources to be invested in the community so that change could happen the other thing that we that we saw was uh climate and extreme heat so there were Issues around extreme heat, as you can see this heat map, we had statistics about how the south side is hotter than the rest of the city. There are more heat related illnesses in the, than the rest of the city. Um, people were dying from heat strokes and things like that more on the south side than the rest of the city. Um, and so what we said is that we're going to talk about 
how to deal with this. And so we created a greening working group and that we'll talk more about in a second to say, hey, we hear you and we're gonna create something to engage and figure out how we can work together to address some of these issues. The another, another thing that we saw happening was rising housing costs, right? So we see while the South Side has been neglected, now they kind of say, oh, this is the last frontier for, um, for, for housing in general. We say it's the last frontier for affordable housing, but people are coming to the South Side now where the houses were worth 100,000, 150,000, and they're paying three or 400,000 for houses now, right? And what is that doing to the people who have lived there for a really long time and their house is long paid off, but now their taxes are increasing. And there are all these other issues that come with these housing disparities. And so now people can't afford to stay in their homes. And so what we said to that is, okay, let's work together with neighbors and figure out some solutions to that. And when we looked around the country, we found out about some really cool campaigns for advocating for uh, affordable affordable housing, but also getting, getting people into uh, the arena where they can speak on what, um, on what happens and what the development looks like in their community. Again, we'll talk more about that in a second. And then the last thing that I'll highlight for you that we saw when we started working on the South Side was the health inequities. Um, because the land has not been stewarded well, um, it has been the site of genocide, enslavement, abuse, industrial pollution, annexation, redlining, gentrification. Many Black Americans, um, as well as immigrants from Latin America, Central and South America, have experienced intergenerational trauma. And so we wanted to, to think about like, how do we address these issues? How do we think about this? Because we know statistics tell us that people who are have been historically marginalized, all of these stressors make it hard for them to say, hey, I, I want my voice heard because they're trying to deal with the survival stuff. They don't have time to step into the arena where those decisions get made and fight for themselves. And so we said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's work together to figure out some healing solutions. And we'll talk more about healing and how, again, community organizing can bring about healing in communities and um, imagination. And so these are the things that we were coming up against, um, the things that we wanted to, to address when we started working on the South Side. So a little bit about Virginia Community Voice. This is our mission and vision. Um, our mission is to equip neighbors in historically marginalized communities to realize their vision for their neighborhoods and prepare institutions to respond effectively. I know that's a big vision, <laughs> um, our mission, and then our vision is a big one. It's one that um, we know will probably outlive us, but it's a Commonwealth of Virginia where decisions are made equitably. So how, so how do we use this mission to address these racial inequities? Well, we're a community engagement organization with a focus on community liberation, right? We're hoping that our work that, you know, we'll work ourselves out of a job because people have all these leadership skills and qualities and all the things they need to thrive and survive and to make their voice heard in their community. We equip people who are directly affected by these issues um, on the South side to say, to have a say in their own solutions. And we do this in an anti-racist liberatory approach um, to building community power. And so a little bit about our process before we jump into kind of the meat of what all of these things have done for the community. Uh, let me just, okay, that's, <laughs> that's what it's going to be. Um, we have a four-step process. So the first step of our process, and before I get too deep in this, and I, I know I can't see you because I'm presenting right now, but I do want to take get everyone to take a minute to take a deep breath. Close your eyes for a minute. And think about a time where you were listened to, like really listened to. Think about a time that you were listened to. And you can feel free to drop it in the chat. The question I'm going to ask you is, how, how did that make you feel? So, so imagine that. And then imagine a time where not only were you listened to, but then somebody came along and said, okay, well, we're gonna bring resources to that thing that you told us. We're going to organize around that thing that you told us. We're not just gonna listen, but we're gonna take action. Think about a time that that happened for you. How did that make you feel? Again, please drop it in the chat. So, so our process is to, is to listen first. And in, a, in communities like, like mine, the, have been historically marginalized and are um, 
and have historically not been listened to and historically not been heard. And when you're asking for 12 years for something and it's still not coming about, you start to believe that you don't matter. Your voice doesn't matter. Who you are doesn't matter. But then when somebody comes along and genuinely listens to you and stays in it with you and engages with you in this space, you start to feel like, wait, I do matter. My voice does matter. It takes time to build that trust. But then we know that people start to open up and they start to dream and imagine things for their community that they didn't imagine before. So the first step in our process is to listen to community. And I know that sounds cliche. I know that sounds like, oh, that's what everybody's saying, let's listen. But listening to act and to move forward what people say is very different than just listening and saying, okay, you were heard, I wrote down your response and that's and it's not going anywhere. The next thing we do in our process is connect people around the issues that they wanna see done. Right. And so we're um, organizing people around those things. So, so, so I'll talk in a second about where we um, what we heard from community in our first listening process. Then we connect them around those things that they want to focus on. And then together we craft solutions with them, equitable solutions with them. They're at the table crafting solutions with us. And we'll give some examples of that in a second. And then we reflect on the process. And this is a really important piece of our process because I think a lot of times nonprofits, organizations, even governments, right? We do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And we say, okay, well this is just what we do. And this is where the funding is and this is how we this is how we do it. But we're not actually reflecting it on whether or not that thing is the thing that people still need. And so this reflection process offers us an opportunity to stop and say, hey, was this process equitable? Did people feel included? Also, is this the solution what people wanted to see through the process? And obviously, we're doing all of this intentional engagement throughout that process. But this reflection time gets, gives us a time to pause and stop and say, let's think about whether or not this is still the right path for us. And this has really saved us long, long to, a lot of um, a lot of pushback, a lot of a lot of losing engagement because people actually know when we go through a process, we're actually going to listen to what people have to say. And so, um, so this is what people have had to say. So this is our first community survey in 2017. We've done multiple surveys since then, but um, these are the things that people said. And so, I want to point out that the the top thing on this list and the thing that 40% of the people who were part of the survey process said was neighborhood beautification and green space. That was um, the biggest thing that people wanted to focus focus on. And so it wasn't just about um, picking up trash, which was that was part of it, right? And that's also obviously a climate issue, right? Trash and, and, um, and all of these things in our community, getting into our stormwater, doing all of these negative things to the community. The community said, hey, we don't want that. But it was also about community pride. It was about beautification, about having, um, you know, planting flowers and trees and all of these things and having access to green space. That was a big part of that first survey process. 40% of the people of the thousand person survey said this is what the most important thing to them. And that has evolved into our greening work and into our climate resilience work. Um, they also said that they wanted safety on the community. If you, again, walk in the streets of Richmond with me and you were to come into our community, you would see that um, the major thoroughfare in our community is um, Route 1 that goes through the, the, the south side of Richmond. Um, that is a thoroughfare from 95, right? So people that runs parallel with 95. So sometimes if there's traffic on 95, people get off and drive down Richmond Highway um, like bats out of hell. <laughs> and, and what it was actually doing was making the community less safe. And because of, you know, lack of urban planning, lack of like really intentionality around this community, there are not a lot of crosswalks. There are not a lot of um, stop signs. There's not a lot of spaces for people to get through the community safely. And actually people were dying just trying to cross the street. And so thinking about these kinds of things, thinking, thinking about even climate solutions to these things um, has, has been kind of where we've ended up and where we're going. And so then, right, these other issues were, were super important to people and we'll talk about how we address each of these issues. So our programs to, to actually live these issues out. So the first program, if you remember, our mission is to equip neighbors in historically marginalized communities to realize their vision for their neighborhoods. This is the first program that we work, our RVA Thrives program on the South Side of Richmond with neighbors on the South Side, going deep with them on these issues that we've been doing for almost a decade, increases neighborhood leadership over the issues 
affecting the decisions affecting the Richmond Highway Corridor. And then our second process is, our second program responds to the second program, which is to prepare institutions to respond effectively. Community, our Community Voice Blueprint, we've actually written a guide if you wanna to go to our website, it's uh, vacommunityvoice.org. You can download this guide for free and use it in your communities. We'd love, love to have you download it. Um, but it's, it's about a guide to how we did all of these things, how we engaged the community, how we got to these issues, how we got to this place. Um, and the Community Voice Blueprint is um, our training and coaching program. So we both train organizations throughout Virginia, but we've trained th organizations throughout the country and throughout the world. And since 2020, we've trained um, almost 600 people in this process from about 150 unique organizations throughout the country and some from other countries as well. And so really the focus of, of our work, and this is kind of what our blueprint work is about, is how to build this power in community, how to engage people of, um, uh, with equity and with intention and with liberation and with um, anti-racist policies. Um, we start with building power and leadership. So our steering committee is, a, is a, made up of a group of neighbors that have lived on the South Side for a really long time. When we say leadership in community organizing terms, we mean people with an identifiable following. So people that can walk alongside with you through this process, people that they can bring other people with them to, um, to you know, community meetings, to the things that we wanna change, bring people to the table. And so our steering committee is made up of people and they really guide where we're going as an organization. We have working groups. Um, again, remember earlier when I said that connect piece, so we're connecting people around the things that they wanna see done. So our working groups is where we do that. We have a housing working group, we'll talk about that in a second. We have a greening working group, we'll talk about that in a second. And these are the places where we're working with community to build those solutions to the problems that we're facing. We also have our leadership academy where we heard from neighbors and, that said, hey, we want to figure out how to do this too, and we need to build our own leadership capacity. It's not that they don't have leadership capacity, is that there's no, that investment hasn't been there. And so, so we have a leadership academy where we've worked with leaders um, to talk about what they want to learn, what they want to see done, and then, and then train them in that, in those spaces, and then give them outlets to exercise that leadership. We also have equitable develop, our equitable development scorecard, which is a part of our housing working group. Um, it is what is is it was is our response to the development that is coming in the South Side. It's about putting people, getting people to the table with developers and the city to say, hey, we want to have a voice in this development. And so our steering committee, um, this is this is where we build neighbors' capacity um, to to be a part of the work that we're doing. So we're strengthening neighbors' capacity to join. We're doing all of these things. We're learning, scoping issues together, practicing community organizing techniques, and. Another big thing, all of our neighbors are compensated for their time. They are compensated to be in these rooms because this is their thought leadership. This is their expertise that they're bringing to this room for these issues that they've experienced for most of their lives. And so we say, hey, you need to be compensated for that. I'm compensated because I'm here, right? You should be compensated for your time too. So all of our neighbors are compensated at no less than $20 an hour for being a part of these of this work because it feels important. And it and it also invests in them is like, hey, not only does your voice matter and you need to come and coming to these meetings, but it, it should be compensated. And that also builds more trust with communities when they believe that coming to this table is also a table that, that they're going to be compensated for their intellectual property, essentially. Um, all of our meetings are bilingual because we have a large and growing uh, Spanish speaking community on the south side of Richmond. And so we, again, we're trying, we're working to make sure that we're bringing these communities together to work on these issues. And so on the Leadership Academy, these are a couple of things that came. I'm going to go a little bit faster just for time to make sure we get to some of these other things. But these are the things that came out of our conversation with neighbors about what they wanted to learn about leadership. So they focused on community organizing and gathering support for change. How do we do that? How do we find self-interest in all of our different neighbors and engage them in these conversations? How do we do that work? And so community organizing is one of those things that we're going to we're training neighbors on. Uh, understanding city government was another big thing. It's like, how do we, this is an enigma. How do we get anything done? How do we figure this out? And so we're engaging and training neighbors on that and bringing, um, you know, 
bolstering their leadership um, uh, their leadership uh, potential in this way. And then one to ones, this is a tool in community organizing that we use to engage community. They wanted to know, how do I talk to my neighbors about what I want to see? How do I engage them in these conversations? So we're doing training and teaching them um, about one to ones. And so you can see all of the issues. And so we built a curriculum around all these things because this is what we heard from from the community. And now we're building curriculum to actually train them on these things and then send them back out into their community. And so now we get to the main event, climate resilience. This is our greening work. Our greening working group um, has been incredible. This is the largest group that we that we have. These are the largest group of people. Neighbors care so much, not only about growing food. This is one of the community gardens that we work that we work in, and some of the youth that are a part of that process. Um, they care so much about greening and climate. We, there, the South Side is also a food desert, right? There are no grocery stores within about 20 minutes of, of um, this you know, area of 20,000 people. So you have to drive or take public transportation, which is not always reliable, all of these things just to get food. And so we said, okay, we are not yet in the, don't yet have the power to negotiate a grocery store for the, for the South Side. But what we can do is try to deal with this issue from a place of organizing neighbors to grow their own food, engaging them in, the, in that process and trying to move this conversation forward through, um, through those processes. So it's not just about gardens being pretty and a cool thing to do. It really is a response to an issue that community said that they needed. We do clean updates on the South Side cleaning up trash and all of these things because people said, I want pride in my community and I want I want a clean community. We're also working with our um with neighbors. These are some of the some of the some of the neighbors that are involved. We have probably 40 or 50 people involved in our greening working group on a regular basis. Um, this is some of the neighbors at one of our cleanup days um, showing off their cool greening cleaning shirts. Um, this is another cleanup day that we that we've done. But these are all these are all examples of neighbors saying, this is what we wanna do. There's a new park development that we've been involved with with the city and it's coming online soon. And so our youth programming, um, our youth program ARCA, it stands for Art, Racial Reconciliation and Civic Advocacy, is really about bringing black and uh, Latin youth together to work on um, both issues of understanding each other, how do we come together, but then they do art installations. Um, they've done, uh, art installations on the ground, like uh, murals, street murals. Um, and this, and this la the last two years they've been working in this park that has not come online yet to design it for the city around um, art here. And so you can see they did a, a medicine color wheel um, with some local artists, a um, black artist named Hamilton Glass in our, in our community who's renowned far beyond Richmond. And, um, Alfonso Perez Acosta, who um, they work together with these youth to engage them around this work in the community. So we also, um, part of part of our park development, part of working um, in this park and others, this is a, a EPA and Chesapeake um, Bay Trust funded garden uh, where uh, we, with community, built this design, worked together to figure this out. And when um, we had a visit from from our EPA friends, they came and saw this garden and neighbors have been planting it out. They're so excited. There's a rain catchment system. There's all of these things and people are so excited to grow food together and work on these things together. And so um, our housing work is also um, really important in this process. And we know how connected housing and um, housing issues and climate issues, how they intersect and how they how they work together. And so the issue that I mentioned earlier around housing development and how people are now, like there was no interest in the South Side and now there's all this interest in the South Side and now people are getting kicked out and they can't stay in their homes and all of these things. Um, we've created what we call an equitable development scorecard. And this essentially, it's literally a scorecard. The community comes in, scores the development, um, under these priorities that the community has identified. So it's, it was a two-year process of working with community to identify their 
goals with development. They're not saying they don't want development on the South side. They're saying that we want to have a say in that. And climate resilience is a big part of that. So they were talking about like, why don't we have permeable surfaces in our community? Why instead of putting asphalt in a community, wouldn't you, that absorbs heat and makes our, our makes this heat island worse, why wouldn't we put permeable surfaces in that can um, water can get through to deal with the flooding issues that we have on the South side? All of these things come into play in our equitable development scorecard. If you'd like to take a look at that, feel free to go to our um, website. It's on our website that you can kind of peruse through it. And if you're interested in creating a scorecard for your own community, please feel free to um, reach out to us because we can definitely work with you on that development. And so this is another example of the scorecard. If you were to see it on our website, this is what it looks like. These are the, the areas that, uh, that we focus on um, in the scorecard. So community engagement, like how are you engaging the community about this, uh, this project, food access and security, safety. I mentioned safety issues before around moving through the community, equitable jobs access. So all of the issues that we've been working on, housing and neighborhood development, and there's also a climate resiliency um, priority area as well. And all of these issues that we've been working forever, they all made it into the scorecard to try and pull all of those things together and thinking about housing and development. So the last thing that I wanna to talk to you all about today is our um, healing work. So community organizing in itself, as I mentioned that exercise that we did earlier around what does it feel like to be listened to, right? I hope, and I will say for me, when I think about like the times that I've been listened to, whether it's my spouse, whether it's a friend, whether it's at work, wherever, all of the times that I've genuinely be listen, been listened to and heard, um, that in itself is healing. And that's a big part of our process. But after the pandemic, we saw a very clear need for community to say, hey, listen, we knew, we already knew. I, I went over the history, 500 years of trauma and history and all of these things. While it does not define us, it 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 does, it does speak to the resources and the ability, what our bodies have had to go through. So we know that we've needed we've needed healing for a really long time. But what we what we realized after the pandemic, because we got funds to help families and um, a few, you know, a few hundred families that we were able to give, you know, uh, gap funding to for rent and food and all of these things. Um, we heard this cry come from the South side. And I know from all of our communities and like, we have to have healing. We can't just move past this terrible thing that happened to all of us without healing. But we know that communities that have been historically marginalized were hit harder by this. And recently we were in a meeting with um, neighbors talking about this work and asking what a healing space would be. And one of them said, hey, we need a place to grieve. We need a place that we can have some time to deal with all, communally deal with all of the trauma that we've experienced. But we also know that research shows that when we have all of this trauma on our body and when we have not been able to rest, um, it's really hard to, to get activated, to step into these spaces where we can actually do something about the problems that are, uh, that are um, plaguing our communities. And so this is the reason that we've come up with um, neighbors again, designed with us together, the South Richmond Center for Rest and Healing. We've identified some spaces that um, the community really wants to see this, but this is what we heard from people when we were asked, when they were asked what they want from a healing space, a place for physical health, right? Where they can move their bodies, breath work, all of those things, mental health support, activities for well-being, um, information about social supports, things, a place where they can come and learn all of these things so they're not subjected to, to go to all of these different places just to get a little bit of information. All of these things are things that people said that they wanted in this process. And so when we ask this question, when you think about a healing space, what comes to mind? They said, clean, safe space, a park, to see families walking, exercising, breathing fresh air, access to green space is so important. Having intentional design around a human scale to promote human connections um, with each other and the environment around them. Peace, let there be peace where we can walk quietly, a place where people can gather and rest. 
clean space, diverse space, multi-purpose spaces, all of these things that community, they dreamed this. This was not us. And when you bring people to the table that have typically not had a seat at the table, this is the kind of thing that they that they dream. And so we do have some ideas of, of, of spaces for this. We're still working on trying to get, um, trying to acquire a space for this healing hub. But this is the kind of thing that neighbors dreamed up. This is what they said through our process. They wanted some affordable housing, right? They wanted some places because again, healing the land, getting back in right, right relationship means that everybody has a space where they can call home. And, and in our communities, access because of redlighting, because of racist policies, access to these kinds of spaces has not been readily available. And so wanting some space for affordable housing. They want an orchard, right? Where we can grow trees, we can have all of these spaces, a retention pond, um, a, 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 an urban farm where we can process some of the food, right? Because we know that, you know, we have these urban gardens, but not everybody's going to eat the fresh food because they don't have time. Or like, I have a pretty prolific garden in my backyard. I don't get all those tomatoes every time. And so this is a space where we can think about like, okay, we actually have a place to process food. Maybe we can it. Maybe we flash freeze it. Maybe we still give people options to getting fresh food, but we do that in the community. We ask them what they want to grow. We bring, we, we come together and put our hands uh, to the plow together and work together to figure out how we can feed our community and and meet these caloric gaps that um, that our community has until we can get the the larger um, resources that are needed, like grocery stores and things like that. Um, there's also a healing garden. If you see in the beginning, people want a place, a peaceful place to be. So this is a a vision of 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 a, a peaceful place to engage by investing in community rest, healing, and rejuvenation. We can begin to repair the wounds of the past and set this outside on a new path toward thriving once and for all. These are just some more pictures of what we could do, a multi-purpose space, all of these things, community farms. And this, I'm gonna leave, leave us with this picture um, because when community is deeply engaged in what is needed to bring about transformation and change, this is what can be imagined, sitting peacefully, engaged with other people, seeing the movement. This is the vision that the community came up with. And when they are at the table, this is what they will imagine and envision and see for the future. And so a place of peace where everyone is safe and that they can have what they need to, to, to thrive and rest and create that future for the rest of the community that is what we are doing at Virginia Community Voice. And this is what can happen when community is deeply engaged in conversations about their community and their neighborhoods and the future that they can have. Thank y'all so much for this conversation. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, we, we are running um, in the minute, the time, in the minute that we have left. Yes. I mean, yeah, I wish I could listen to you talk all day. Your passion <laughs> that comes through is so inspiring and I I love it. Um, we maybe have one a time for a quick question. Uh, you're getting some love in the chat, but uh, mm -hmm. somebody was wondering um, mm -hmm. if you received EPA funding, if your group received EPA funding. We have not yet. We have not also not applied yet. So we're okay. in the process of applying and um, hopefully we'll see what, what comes from that. Lots of opportunities coming mm -hmm. down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some more in the chat. But well, we that's not true. We, 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 we did receive EPA funding for the garden that I showed you in the original picture. And that 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 garden, that was a small grant that we got um, along with um, the Chesapeake Bay. There was a, um, a connection with the Chesapeake Bay and the EPA, but we're <laughs> hoping to, to get some more opportunities for, for larger. Well, there is there is one more question, you know, talking about expanding um, your presentation focused on South side of Richmond? Do you have any engagement with communities outside of Richmond? And if yeah. not, do you have plans to do so? Yeah, we do have engagement. So what we decided, and I'll say this very, as quickly and succinctly as possible, because I know we're at time. Um, what we decided when we when we started working um, in the community is that we are going to go deep on the South side. Our community organizing efforts stay on the South side and we'll stay that way. The way that we think about scale is through our training and coaching program. So we're not going to come into your community and help and, and you know, build uh, RBA Thrives in your community. But what we will do is walk alongside you, train you, coach you through that process. And so 
so we think that that's the better way to scale because we don't want to just do things for people. We want people's mindsets to be changed and be thinking about this kind of work on a regular basis. So call us if you're interested in some of our coaching and training to build programs like this in your own community. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I'll, I'll pass it back to Alex just to close us out, but. Leah, <clears throat> thank you so much. Delaney, thank you for, for monitoring the chat. Um, thanks for everybody for joining and experience what I had the pleasure of experiencing in person a few months back. It's just an incredible message, incredible work, absolutely inspiring and motivating and just really, really, really appreciate you and, and everyone a part of your organization. Please check out their website. I know that the slides will be available. Mm -hmm. We'll stay, we'll all stay connected, but thank you for your incredible work. Thank you. Um, Dylan, thank you. Dylan, I know, I think we're headed to kind of the final um, message from our regional administrator to close out today. So yeah. um, <clears throat> I'll turn it over to you, but thank you again, Leah. Thank you. And yes, thank you so much, Leah. And as I kind of give this ending spiel, feel free to drop any links in the chat or how to communicate with you. I know that that was something that many people were interested in hearing about. And so thank you again so much. But yes, I have the you know utmost pleasure of letting everyone know, you know, thanking you all for joining us for the summit today. And please don't forget to fill out the survey that we have posited with, you know, feedback for you to give on the different sessions and kind of your experience throughout today's summit. And you can access that by visiting the link that I believe has been posted in the chat, as well as scanning the QR code before you. And I am just going to double, perfect, okay. Um, and so I have a short video to kind of conclude today's summit. And then following the video, I will close out this room. And it is brief remarks from our regional administrator, Adam Ortiz. So let me get started with that. Hey everybody, I wanna thank you for stepping up and stepping into the Mid-Atlantic Summit this year, whether it's your first time or whether you've been here before, we're glad that you participated and listened and learned and feel empowered. So whether you're a community member, an environmental justice crusader, an academic, a scientist, a student leader, um, a resident who just showed up to listen and find out how they can help. We just want to thank you for whatever you're doing in your leadership role, whether it's in your business or in your university or even in your household, it matters. I also want to thank all the speakers and moderators who shared their experiences and wisdom today. I want to thank Tom Perez from the White House, uh, my boss, uh, EPA Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe, our state secretaries, uh, we had tremendous participation and we talk all the time. So those of you in the state should know that your principals are having uh, a lot of conversations with us here at EPA on a consistent basis. I wanna thank our meteorologists. Uh, we don't usually have meteorologists, um, but they have an incredible perspective to have. Every day they're watching the weather and the changing weather and its impacts on local communities and their personalities that everybody knows and listens to. So we're thrilled to have their participation. Also our other federal agency partners. There is a team um, here at the federal level that is working together. We all have a different piece, whether it's the Army Corps of Engineers or NOAA or the Forest Service, we're all working in the environment together. And I wanna thank all of them, our federal partners who showed up today. Um, also thank, I wanna thank some other <clears throat> newer voices uh, to, um, to conferences like this, uh, Dar Williams and Russell Armstrong, um, you know, tremendous cultural perspective, reaching people that we might not be able to reach otherwise and, and you know, feeling connected and empowered to audiences, you know, who need to feel, feel connected. So I wanna thank them as well. And also all the folks behind the scenes. Um, for months, we've been planning uh, this with many of our state partners and, and state associations, uh, local leaders. So just thank you for whatever you did behind the scenes. And it's really about three things for me. It's about engaging, you know, making sure that we're reaching out and listening, whether it's internal, external, because we're all on team environment together. Um, and that's important that we're connected. It's no us against them, it's only us. To align, to make sure that we're bringing our specific competencies or experiences or perspectives or accountability to the table. You know, we need everybody to work on one team together. And then finally to deliver, to get things done, to make sure that we're making a meaningful impact in the places that need it. And that's our focus here in the Biden-Harris administration that we're investing in America 
and in every single corner. And uh, in the two plus years that I've been in this role, me and my team have met with many of you in every single corner of this region, from the southern coal fields of West Virginia, McDowell County, uh, to Erie, Pennsylvania, in the upper northwest corner, to uh, Scranton and Wilkes-Barre, in those historic communities um, in the northeast, and um, all the way down to Hampton Roads um, in, in the southeast, and hundreds and hundreds of places in between. So we're showing up across sectors, uh, across cities, urban and rural, uh, and making sure that we're doing everything that we can to give a boost to the folks on the ground. And, you know, the CPA is a little bit different um, than maybe uh, EPAs in the past or um, the stereotypes of us. We are working closely with sectors that we haven't engaged so much before. We have been working closely with the agriculture community, with farms. We're reaching out to the private sector uh, across the board, uh, including uh, factories. We're showing up to old cities. Uh, we're showing up uh, to farmlands, um, you know, regardless of uh, what kind of production farms are doing, we're, we're engaging uh, with them closely as well. We know that there's historic waterways uh, that we all impact, um, and it, there's three major ones in, in our region, and we've showed up to all of them. We're also showing up to the fence line communities, the places that border the polluters, and we're also showing up to beautiful national parks like the New River Gorge, our newest national park in West Virginia. And it's important that we do that because everybody's on a you know, shares, you know, a commitment to our environment and we need to work together. Also, we're showing up in, you know, newer places that are sprouting up from old brownfields uh, and also neighborhoods that were once racially and economically segregated from redlining, communities that have been on the margins, but not anymore. And all these places, we love to get out. We love to see what folks in the community see and, and live with it, 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 it every single day. So we've been walking uh, the streets, we've been wading in the waters, we've been paddling, and we've seen and heard, in some cases smelled, um, you know, things that need our attention. Uh, so we're committed and we're engaged. And um, we still got a lot of work to do. Uh, don't want to um, understate that in any way, shape or form. But um, the good news is that we're working together, you know, more than ever before, you know, across all these sectors, across, you know, all these different corners of our region, you know, and um, <clears throat> again, no us against them. It's only us. And, and that's how we're doing it. Because, you know, we talk about these historic investments and, you know, all this uh, level of funding that's never been available for, before. And that's great. And that's important. Um, but our measure of success is going to be whether we get these resources to the right people in the right places with the right projects, you know, to make a difference, the places that need it the most. And that's where so many of you come in. And that's the alignment piece, you know, alignment, alignment, making sure we're giving a boost to folks on the ground who are doing great work, who know what the solutions are, <clears throat> and that we're getting the resources in their hands, in your hands. And the delivery is important, you know, to make sure that this isn't talk, you know, this is walk. Um, that at the end of the day, the wastewater treatment plants or the drinking water systems are, are upgraded and healthy. That kids are riding in more and more electric school buses um, and that the bus drivers have a less stressful uh, experience and it's one of the toughest jobs in our region. That's a big deal that matters. Community solar, um, transitioning to more renewable energy, uh, that we're investing in the capacity of tribes and community organizations uh, because they're doing the work on the ground. We're supporting our teachers and our schools and, and our students because they're the future and that we're working to make progress, you know, in all of our historic waterways, the Delaware, the Ohio River watershed and the Chesapeake Bay in between, you know, that we're paying attention to all of them because folks see and hear and live in those watersheds every single day and they deserve the highest quality of life and the cleanest water possible. But moving forward, um, we are going to continue to prioritize our commitment to these communities that have been historically on the margins. And that includes our tribes in particular, our resilient First Nations that have had a historic connection to our region. Uh, they, um, you know, many of, the, many of our waterways and some of our states even bear the names uh, of these First Nations. And it's our commitment in this administration that we empower and help reconnect tribes to these historic lands, again, that often, you know, bear their names, and that we also listen and learn from them, because they have incredible wisdom, incredible experience, and um, and so much of our nation owes an incredible debt to them. So we are showing up and we're listening. And these communities that bear more than their fair share of stressors, 
you know, with data and just with years and years of institutional knowledge and, and working with all sorts of activists and, and with the government, we know what, where many of these places are. We've identified 37 priority engagement communities, places that um, have environmental justice concerns. And they're not all urban. You know, they're certainly urban stressors, but we know that rural communities are often forgotten and we're engaging and showing up there and investing and walking in those communities and helping empower them uh, for the solutions that they need. You know, a lot of these environmental justice challenges, urban, rural, and everywhere in between are decades and in some cases, centuries in the making. Uh, they're complex, they're social, uh, cultural, economic, uh, as well as environmental. And we have to work together across you know, many different disciplines, listen to many voices to help untie these stubborn knots uh, that have been tied for too long. But, you know, if anything uh, is taken away from today, it's that EPA and our role, uh, and we do have a role, but we can't do this alone. We need you. We need each and every one of you and the organizations and institutions and the neighborhoods that you represent. We have to build these partnerships, you know, across sectors. <clears throat> Should, you know, historical adversaries have to come together because we have so much to do. It's the only way that we're going to solve these stubborn problems and help hand a cleaner and healthier environment to the next generation. So if you're here today, um, I think you share that belief that change is possible, that we can get things done, that cynicism is not an option, as failure is not an option. You know, we have got to work together. And this includes the tough stuff. You know, climate change can feel very overwhelming, no question. Um, these communities that have been stuck uh, in cycles of environmental justice, you know, it's, it, it, can, it can be disheartening and overwhelming, but change is possible when we work together. Change is possible when we're intentional. Change is possible when we care. And, uh, and you know, I, I am committed to working together and undoing the false narrative that we're too divided, that, you know, rural can't work with urban or that farmer can't work with environmentalist or that um, working class folks can't work with academics. I do not believe that. I believe that we're one team and we have to when we will work together. So going forward, you know, let's commit to that, to engage, you know, across, you know, all sectors and all different types of folks and communities for to protect this incredible resource that we've inherited to align that we're going to work together, that we're going to bring all of our skills and competencies together and perspectives to figure things out and that we're going to deliver, that we're going to get things done and that we're going to keep it moving. So um, if uh, you couldn't tune in to everything today and there was a lot, or if you had to miss something or had to step away, or if you want to go back to something, no worries. We recorded each session. They'll all be available online in a couple of weeks and we'll send a notice out uh, to let you know about that. So please go back if you're interested in something or if you want to share something with a colleague or a friend, don't hesitate. And also don't hesitate to stay in touch with us. You know, we, as you can tell, are, are highly engaged and highly committed to our common success. So don't be shy, you know, follow us on social media and we have a lot of good stuff on social media. Um, we're gonna send you a, a survey as well uh, to let us know what you thought about the summit. If you think there's anything we're missing or anything that we should do again, we want to know, um, but please don't be shy. We're on your team. So thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in the upcoming months.